Hey guys, I just want to say thanks for tuning into this uh, video podcast. Video podcasts are not our bread and butter. Video in general is not our bread and butter, but uh, we're thinking about making a little more of an effort on YouTube and you know reels and shorts and all that stuff. So um, if you like the way this video is put together, or if you'd like to see video podcasts put together a certain way, uh, message us and let us know. We just decided to try something different with this one. Um, we had a ton of fun on this episode, so just want to say thanks. If you wouldn't mind liking, sharing, subscribing, all that YouTube stuff. Um, but thanks for being here. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, if you don't like the video, we're available on every audio platform that you can find podcasts. So later. Welcome to the podcast. It's a working class bow hunter. If you, uh, we're deaf and didn't hear that intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, Kurt Geyer speaking. Eric Common. Doug Schmidt. Austin Chandler. Guest hosting. Lee Her. La Her. And leader. special guest of the hour or hours, depends on how far he drags us into the trenches tonight. We'll see. Mr. Jared Mills. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being in studio for this. Yeah, this is yeah. awesome. You guys do it right. This is this is a sweet setup. Careful. You. you don't want to get ahead of yourself. You might regret <laughs> I, doing I, I'm this. I'm going to be the co-host. Or, Guest co-host pretty soon. That's what we need. That's what we need. Trying to take Lee's spot, huh? Lee, you're done. Get out. (laughs) Short-lived, but it was good. (laughs) Yeah, it was great having you. Great six months. For real, thanks for being coming in to do it in studio. We could have done it over the phone, which would have been fine, but this is just way better. So yeah, man, appreciate you guys having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I didn't realize you were as close as you are. Yeah, it was easy drive, less than two hours. So it was it was really close. Money, well. So you've kind of been a hot topic on the internet. What I'm going to do, I'm going to hit you hard right away, and then we're just going to go into fun conversation. Let's do it. You've been a hot topic on the internet. One, you killed giants, and that's always intriguing, right? But um, maybe some career changes. Maybe there's some new game plans. I'm just getting this right, rip the Band-Aid off, and then we can put this behind you and talk about fun stuff, because I'm sure you're tired of hearing (laughs) that question. Yeah, that's the first time I've heard it, actually. (laughs) Right. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, Oh. that's how good we are. um, you've left Midwest Whitetail. People are wondering what you're going to do now. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a tough decision for sure. Midwest Whitetail has been such a big part of my life forever. I mean, you think back, this is my first job out of college and I didn't do it full time for that, that entire period, but it was, I still did it on the side for 12 years straight. You know, yeah. I, whatever job I was working, I'd come home to my apartment or my house and edit middle sweat tail for, for Bill. So, yeah, you know, I was able to be a part of it from the early days and, and grow with it and help it grow and, and all that. And I've, the last four or five years, it's been my full-time job managing and running mm-hmm. it. And, you know, when, when it comes to the, the change, it really is a career change for me. You know, it's, it's not a lateral move. It's not just filming from middle sweat tail to filming and doing my own thing there's a lot of moving parts to the middle swipe tail business and it's, it's grown, it's evolved. And mm-hmm. you have, uh, you know, employees, pro staff, a lot of partners and constantly ch- just trying to, to grow and stay on top of things. And so there's, it's just a different job. It's, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of stress and stuff, but ultimately I think, you know, any, anybody in their career should want to, you know, get out of something that they put into it. And yeah, and it's not it's not a, a problem with the middle swipe tail brand or anything. It's just kind of the nature of it being bought and sold a number of times over the years. And it just for me personally, it just wasn't what I saw as a long term career option. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm motivated by, you know, creating so I love the creation of so I love um brand creation. I love starting and trying to grow things. And so this situation, while scary, it's saying you, you're leaving a job and going from a steady income to nothing, mm-hmm. you know, I'm motivated by that. So I, I have a unique opportunity to start with a blank slate and I'm trying to kind of keep that in perspective, evaluate different opportunities. And I'm, I'm grateful for all the opportunities that are out there, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to be patient and, and really think long term. Like what is, what, what can I draw up that's going to be rewarding for a long time to come. I, I, I want to grind. I'm in the peak of my working career, but what can I put in to something that's going to be worth it ultimately for me? And just, yeah. you know, provide a good environment, you know, at, from a family man standpoint too. Yeah, you know, for I, sure. I have a wife and a young daughter and sometimes you don't realize how much the, the stress from your daily job carries over into those other aspects of life. And that was kind of the, 
you know, peaking moment for me was that when you start to realize what that stress, the impact it's having and yeah, at home, you know, yeah. Just trying to keep it enjoyable. And, and even the hunting aspect, like it's people talk about it all the time but until you're in that situation of seeing how much making hunting a part of your job affects your enjoyment of hunting. Yeah. Like at this season, I can't tell you how enjoyable this past season was and granted being successful helps that tremendously. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But, um, even, giants <laughs> <to add in. laughs> even if I didn't have the success, just getting back to enjoy, it felt like what it used to be like. Right? Yeah. I know what you're saying. It, it was, it, it was disconnected from the job atmosphere so it's much. It's not part it was, of your job anymore. Yeah. It was, it was a much needed season from that standpoint. Yeah. Um, just getting back to enjoy. I spent basically the entire year by myself. You know, there's a lot of challenges with self filming, but there's also a lot of quiet time, a lot of just enjoyment of being in the woods. And for me, I didn't realize how much I needed that mm -hmm. until I went through this season. So it was, it was, I can't tell you how big that was for me just to get back to the enjoyment of hunting. That's cool, man. Yeah. No, I mean, your answer makes sense. I think everyone can kind of relate to that on a certain level, mm -hmm. no matter whatever career field they're in or what they're doing or even just anything you, you know you can boil that down to just relationships it's kind of like it, that applies to a lot in life but i get it that makes perfect sense yeah yeah it's i mean i <clears> wish <throat> it was as simple as you know people switch jobs all the time it's, yeah, it's unfortunate right. i had to you know <laughs> you're, explain you're, it a lot but it's right. weird to say because we're in hunting but like you're a public figure yeah you it, know like, like as weird as it is to say like People want to yeah. know what you're doing and yeah, and I get it. And I, and, and, and trust me, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the support and, and all that. Um, but at the end of the day, like it may sound like the boring answer, but it really is just a career change for me. It's just, yeah. So do you have a new mission that you're getting ready to like work into? Can you say anything yet? Or like, what's the, there's a couple things that I'm for sure going to get into, but I, I really am still in the evaluation process of just thinking, trying to really be patient and think through what these opportunities will look like two, three years down the road mm -hmm. and not jump into anything smart um, because smart. it, yeah, it's, it's just a unique set. You don't get to reset like that very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to keep, while I'm watching my bank account go down, down, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep that in perspective that yeah. thinking through in the beginning, I'm hope, hoping will be, you know, more beneficial long term. but I, w I am going to work with some different companies and, you know, companies that I hope that I can help move the needle for and help them grow and all that. That's, you know, just part of it. But the, the, the content, I don't love the word content, but I love the filming and production. So I'm not going to change that. I'm going to continue to do that. I enjoy mm -hmm. it. I even yeah, you're good at it. <laughs> if you watch your videos, you can tell you're passionate about oh, it yeah. for sure. Yeah. I, there was one video I was like, I would have said F that camera Man, at this point. Yeah. That's probably the most, yeah, I get that comment a lot, especially <laughs> this year. Yeah. Yeah, this um, year for sure. But yeah, I, I love I love the aspect. Even if no one ever watched another one of my hunts again, I would never leave the camera at home. Right. Mm -hmm. I just, I love the documentation of yep. it and being able to relive I, mean, I think back every deer I've killed for the last decade plus, 12 years, 13 years, whatever, I can relive at any moment. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. And I, I yeah. love that. That's what makes me wish we would like yeah. dedicate and it makes me want to dedicate the filming. But every time I try it, then I just go back to that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, here comes this buck. And then I don't even remember the fucking yeah. cameras there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, like, it's, it, you're, what you just said, I asked uh, Eric from Hush the same thing last week on a podcast, which that may or may not have aired by now in podcast world um, whenever this launches. And basically, he's the same thing. Like, yeah. I just love, like, the aspect of it. Like, he doesn't think about bringing the camera. It just comes with him. It's part of, like, his hunt process. Right. Oh, I'd rather leave my bow at home than no kidding. the camera. I mean, I'll come think about how many hunts. Yeah. Think I'll about come, how many. I'll come with you. <laughs> yeah, you want to film me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can film me. You're not that long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about how many hunts you actually use your bow in a season compared to I mean, the okay, camera. Stuff, yeah, that's true. The that's true. Film. I tried it for Fair the first point. time this year. Hey, I'll let these ads play. I'm playing his, uh, his YouTube yeah, in the background. I, I need the money back. Yeah, here, so I'll, we'll let, let them run, run through. <laughs> <laughs> I tried self-filming this year just to play with it because I've never done it before, and it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's very tough, but you can do it at different levels. Like, you can do it just enough to capture the memory and capture some cool stuff, or you can do it at a higher level as, like, man, you don't want to miss a thing. You want to make sure you replicate that story so that your viewers more tapped that, into a production yeah i guess yeah. well i think just recreating the experience as best as possible for for the mm. viewers some of the some of the comments that i 
like the most because it makes me feel like I did what I set out to do are the ones that say they felt like they're in the tree with me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's, that makes that's sense. like when, when they feel like, man, I felt like I was sitting over your shoulder. That was so intense. Like, I'm like, okay, that's what I wanted to create. Like, yeah. I want that. Well, you've been doing it for so long. It's probably be weird to go without a camera, right? Oh yeah. I've, I'd feel naked out there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like us forgetting our bow or our binos <laughs> yeah. or something, you know? Yeah. That's cool, man. It's I like talking to guys like you, and as we like continue and grow with the podcast, we interview. Um, this is a compliment. I just I, I don't know how I'm going to word it, so I don't want to come off wrong. Like c- calculated guys that are killers, but they're also successful in business, and they have a way. Like Austin, was it you and I talking that like not necessarily big butt killers, but calculated successful hunters always do well in business or whatever they put their mind to. Their wives are normally pretty damn good looking. Guys seem like, to figure it out. Guys seem to <laughs> They're successful yeah. in life. The guys yeah. seem to figure it out. And it, it's cool like seeing the common traits of like a mindset that successful deer hunters carry because of the like the level that you have to be on to be successful in hunting and in an outdoor career or whatever career and you know, with the ladies is just kind of a funny tidbit to add in, but honestly, it's like fairly <laughs> it makes true. Sense, yeah. though. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, it's a life thing, though. It really is. Like it's a life. I, I feel thing. like it, it's a life thing that carries over to hunting and not vice versa. It, it, at least mm. from my perspective, like it's yeah. just different life experiences that that build you as a person. And you know, I, I look back and you know think about the life that you know stuff that I've been through, whether it's you know family stuff or you know even like athletics, like. You know, sports are always a big part of my life, like college baseball, like just the, all those, everything that you get from it, that the intangibles, the work ethic, the dedication, the, you know, all that type of stuff, I think it carries over into everything. And hunting is just one of those things. That it mm-hmm. carries over yeah. Into, so. Yeah. That's a healthier way to word it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're a lot better than our hey, wives are hot. Hey, that's, what, that's what we should have said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's what you're trying to say, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, just, we just need Jared around to word everything better. Dude, yeah. It's just like, me Kurt. compared to Jared, I look like they just spits and throws rocks. Kurt, yeah, Kurt just says, your wife's hot, and then he just spits that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, that's what I, exactly what I said. That's a better way to word that. You get it. Hey, hey we're just being who we are. But no, yeah. I think I think it's just an interesting trait, and you can tell like you have that. Com- it's a successful trait. There's dudes that yeah. are successful that have that. Well, I appreciate I guess, it. You know? I, I feel like I didn't really answer your question with regards to like, what I have planned. Um, so I figured I'd touch on that a little bit, but yeah. again, I, I still am you know, just trying to figure it out a little yeah. bit. Out of respect, I didn't want to like pry on you too hard. I just figured yeah. that's the number one thing people are going to want to hear right for now. Sure. For sure. And, and I feel like I get a little bit closer each day, um, you know, as I spend a lot of time thinking about it. There, One of my goals is to own some brands too and build some brands. Like I said in the beginning, I love the creation process and you know, growing something from scratch. Um, so a couple of categories, like w- one thing I love food plots and just, you know, the, the trial and error that's involved with trying different things. And mm-hmm. so I've spent the last two or three years doing that, working with a buddy and plan on launching my own or our own food plot seed line. Very um, cool. I feel like we have that pretty well dialed and, you know, the, the food plot game is, is interesting you know, it's, it's one thing it's, I'm passionate about it, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there from the standpoint of getting more people to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's this perception of food plots being this kind of rich man's game or you got to own a lot of land or own a lot of equipment. Mm-hmm. And that's not the case. Like there's a lot of guys out there that could plant a little quarter acre, really effective kill plot yeah. you know, on the edge of a farmer's field or wherever, mm-hmm. um, but they need to be educated on what to do how to do it and for sure i think there's a lot of opportunity out there and i think it can be you know the difference in killing a good deer and not for a lot of people to mm-hmm. use so uh i enjoy all that it's process exciting. so it's kind of natural to get into into that and my goal is to own you know a couple of different brands potentially just to just to have more more skin in the game i guess and just just more long-term structure to that rather mm-hmm. than only working with existing categories and and companies that are out yeah no that makes sense Uh, yeah that's all the good long-term like security plan i guess you know yeah yeah and and you just it's just there's just more to it you know there's from a business perspective and it's more challenging and again i'm motivated by that type of stuff so something you can call your own too yeah exactly um and then uh i'm gonna 
it's a little bit smaller scale, but plan on launching like a little lifestyle apparel brand. Um, just, uh, it's kind of a simple one. Like I, I want stuff that I don't have to spend all day doing, like partner with the right people, you know, from like a food plot, for example, I'm a partner with someone that can handle all the fulfillment, Yeah. the, the packaging, the mixing, the packaging, shipping, all that type of stuff. I, I enjoy the brand creation, the marketing aspect of it. Um, figuring out what those products are, mm-hmm. but I don't, I, I'd rather not get tied down with the fulfillment process. I'd rather work on yeah, don't, three brands don't trust rather me. than going all <laughs> in on one. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's kind of my, my goal. And, and, you know, from a bigger picture standpoint, I just want to, it, it sounds kind of corny or whatever, but I want to make a positive impact on the industry one way or another, whether that's, you know, just from an education standpoint or just, you know, sh- I don't know. I, I think about, I mean, you guys see it being in the industry and it gets talked about a lot, just some of the issues the and the division and, you know, just the negativity mm-hmm. overall, just fighting some of that stuff. And, you know, you see certain trends when you're in it long enough and it's your day-to-day business, you see certain trends that it's like you question like that. I don't really like the way this is going. And mm-hmm. so if I can just be, if you know, I've been lucky enough to, to have a platform if I can use that in a positive way to, to fight back against some of that stuff, you know, kind of more steering it a little bit. Yeah. Or just, or just bringing awareness to, there's more than one way to do stuff, you know? (laughs) Right. Like one example, I guess would be, uh, you know, people seems like everyone's always looking for an easier way to do this stuff. And I, and I just think about like how I've gotten to where I am from a hunting standpoint is failing a lot yeah you know, just like how much i've learned just from it being tough mm-hmm. and, and it seems like everyone's just trying to make it easier all the time whether it's like to kill know, deer you're techno- saying yeah i mean yeah. just yeah just to kill deer like the technology that's being introduced and you know yeah it's constantly changing towards that side and i'm afraid that that's not the answer for getting more people involved and that's not the answer for keeping people involved yeah they, i got so much enjoyment or there's so much reward coming from the failure of, you know, just figuring it out and, you know, losing a lot uh, when it yeah. comes to chasing big mature deer that, you know, I wouldn't, I don't see another way to do it. Like, I, I, yeah. don't, I don't think that people will get the enjoyment out of it that I do if you don't go that route. Yeah, no, that's a good point too. I think that's, again, a way more intelligent way to word it than <laughs> we've tried to in the past. We're, we're always like drunk and trying to fight our way through that (laughs) we've said this before it's been a long time ago but we said you can't trip into a 150 it's the same kind of concept you're gonna if you want to go out there and consistently kill big mature deer you're gonna have to put in some effort and work for it and and fail and and figure figure it out out. yeah that's what's fun about it like yeah you you can't trip into a 190 at however close some of your damn deer are that we're gonna (laughs) get into two feet but it's yeah that makes perfect sense to me like i feel like i I'm on the same track with deer at, you know, and like, I look at it as like, you got to climb the ladder of bow hunting and I look like there's different layers of like the process. Yeah. There's, and it's, we're all at a different layer somewhere, you know, it's the experience is such a big part of it. Like, I don't want people to ever lose sight of that. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you talk about not being able to trip in one, a 150 or whatever size deer you want to talk about, but it's there are ways you can make it much easier on yourself in today's world. If you want to, if you want to, but yeah. you do not have to. And I think that's more or less the message I'd want to push is like, you do not have to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I mean, we could run through a million examples of technology you could choose or not choose to use. Mm-hmm. But I think just the, the direction that's going is it's becoming, you have all these tools and I'm not saying I, I can make it way more difficult on myself if I wanted to, but I could make it way easier on myself yeah, too. Yeah, for sure. And I choose not to because of that experience. And and that's, to me, that's how you stay in it long term is if you're, if you're motivated by that. Yeah, I think you stay, I think, I get what you're saying that, like stay in it long term because you could make it really easy and that doesn't mean nothing. Yeah. You're just kind of like, yeah. And then you don't have like the... Um, the grind, the gr- the grind, or like the fulfillment of accomplishing something that was difficult mm-hmm. and rewarding to like keep at it and keep going. Like if winning was easy at everything, nobody'd really strive to do anything. Oh right, yeah. Yeah. right. I guess that's probably the. Well, basic I think a lot of people too now want the success right now. 
Like they're like, well, everybody wants the big buck that. right now, but they don't yeah. want to like figure right. out. And big you know, bucks. they're asking like, what do I do to kill this buck? Well, I mean, did you do your homework? Yeah. Did you do this? Did you do that? Well, what do I got to do to kill this deer tomorrow? I'm like, trial and error, baby. trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, even that mindset, like thinking that that's the pinnacle, killing that deer is the pinnacle. It's not. It's the experience of trying to kill that deer. Right. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what you should be striving for. Have the have the most rewarding experience. Trying to figure him out. I yeah. feel like that's something I've learned too. With like killing some mature deer like i feel like until you've killed your first big deer or whatever your goal is i feel like that's how you look at it like short term like that's the pinnacle but then you get that and you realize how fun the process was to have killed him yeah or you know and then it's like repeatability learning a different deer learning proper i mean man you could slide it's a it branches out in a ton of different ways but um but i feel like that's something that you you learn in levels, but like I'm, I'm still like I have a certain caliber of deer I want to hit as just a personal goal. But I feel like all of us have killed mature deer; they just haven't had that rack on their head. So I think the next layer for me, and I'm there, there's probably some debatable ways to like argue what I'm saying, is finding a deer that has that, and then trying to figure out and put in the work to do it. Yeah, some of that comes naturally. Like you could have that goal, like hey, I want to kill 170 plus. Mm-hmm. And you, during that process of trying to kill it, you'll figure out, okay, it wasn't about the kill. It was about, you know, I learned all that naturally. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what, you know, I, I think that's just so important to keep in, in, in perspective is mm-hmm. the journey, the chase it. And what, what, how long did it take for you to like realize <laughs> that for yourself? Like, did you kill a few big deer? Was it the first one or did you have that from the rip? I didn't, I don't think I had it from the rip. I think. I don't know that there was a moment, to be honest. I mm-hmm. just think that now where I'm at, looking back, I'm so thankful for failing that many times. Like, yeah. It, yeah. I'm so thankful for that I that I have that perspective now. And that's all I want to do is just, just to let more or less bring awareness to that perspective to people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that'll kind of guide some of the decisions they make, you know, as they, especially newer hunters, that's, that's mostly what I'm talking about. But mm-hmm. I, I'm also keep it in, in mind just part of it's our fault as, as a hunting industry yeah right? yeah the stuff that we push mm-hmm. and that's a lot big a lot companies of, marketing certain things big, big certain... gear scored you know yeah all that type of stuff um so so part of it is our fault but yeah i mean I, mm-hmm. just motivated by trying to make a positive impact especially on new owners what do you think's like the most hindering thing for a new hunter right now like what's and we don't have to dive into it but like <clears> what's something you're kind of like you know i'm not against that but i would have maybe done something different or whatever if I were in their like in their shoes, you mean? Yeah, or like or um, in general from a challenge. product or branding or like what's being pushed on a newer hunter. Like what's something you might add an adjustment to? Well, first and foremost, I think it's what I was talking about. Like their perception of it being about the kill, I think is very hindering. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I think it's very deflating too when they think they to make it in the hunting industry or to just to make it among their hunting community friends Mm -hmm. like to be looked at as a good hunter or something they have to do these certain things and they have to have the best looking wall you know that's the type of stuff that i think is a one of the biggest roadblocks in the beginning Mm -hmm. um there's obviously a lot of challenges in today's world with regards to access for for newer hunters and and all that and you know i don't have i don't have the answers (laughs) to figuring that out other (laughs) other than just we could to, argue. Yeah. <laughs> we figure some things out to argue about. Yeah. Other than or make the, up an argument. Keeping things relative, right? You yeah, know, a, yeah. A guy that hunts 2,000 acres of, of heavily managed land in a good neighborhood should not have the same goals as the guy that's you know, yeah. on public land or small parcels or whatever. I think that's a problem, too, is guys with <clears throat> obviously different attainable goals are just not at that moment hating each other for having different goals. Oh, yeah. And there's, like, there's hey. way too much comparing in the hunting industry and competition like there literally should be no competition in anything that doesn't have a level level playing field and hunting does not have a single level playing field. You're point. Right. That's yeah. a good against yourself yeah unless you're it. hunting yeah. the exact same property and you have the exact same amount of days to hunt same i mean there, there's you can't too many variants you can't show me one scenario where there's a level playing field so there's, there's too much comparing like new hunters comparing themselves to other people or you know, yeah. seasoned hunters or whatever. And that, again, that's partly, 
our fault as a hunting industry mm-hmm. based on the things we promote. Yeah. yeah. It's great for us because that's con- that's arguable <laughs> for us as a podcast brand. <laughs> You're like, not wrong. Keep that shit because com- it's fun to talk about, you know, yeah. but but that's also a very good point. Like, uh, it's fun conversation, for example, it's fun conversation, like, who's the king whitetail killer? Now, oh. There's never gonna, an all-time winner. You can't ever say, "Oh, it's this guy is the number one whitetail killer, hands down." Like he's not beating up other hunters to get the title. You know what I mean? Exactly. But what we do word it as, it's like, "Who's Doug? Who's your top three big buck idols or killers in your brain?" Who are Jared you? Mills? <laughs> yes. Number one. Jared, number one. Jared, all Jared. three. <laughs> But <laughs> so, but that's the way that that's the way that gets approached, and it's fun to argue that. It, yeah, it's fun, but there's zero backing to it. There's zero. zero. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. a lot it of makes awesome too, content. Yeah, see, fun. like you know, all the big deer, the popular people are killing. And it's like, well, I need that. Like, give me, I want that yeah. big deer. Well, I yeah, think yeah. Austin kind of put me in his perspective this year because you know we had the chip <laughs> bet going on, and I was like, God damn, this year kicked my ass. And he's like, Dude, you had a great year. I'm like, because you got to see two booners. Three. Three, Three booners. booners. You know how many like, booners I saw this year? Fucking none. Yeah. Right. And, then, and then I kind of... <laughs> right there with you. Dude. <laughs> yeah. dude, I kind of took a step back after you said that. You know, I, I was like, you know what? It was a damn good season. Like, you know, yeah, I was, was right in the pocket. I just... Yeah. Any season you can go and lay eyes on three booners where I hunt. I mean, that's almost unheard of. Three that's different a, booners, yeah, right? That's a hell three of a season. Three different booners, yeah. See, it's all perspective and, yeah. and relative. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. You know, to some guys, that's an average season. To some yeah. guys, that's a dream season. Yeah. That's right. like, right. with me, I didn't even kill a buck this year, and it's one of the most Curse. fun seasons I've ever had. Like, yeah. The most enjoyment I've gotten out of a season because I hunted a lot. I saw a lot of deer. wasn't successful from a, a kill standpoint, but like the experiences I had during my season and what I learned during this season were exponentially more than last year when I had the best year of my life. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the 200 inch curse is a real thing. Have you ever experienced a 200 inch curse? I have not. I've not gotten there. Don't tell them about it. It's going to happen. <laughs> the, no, I want the 200 inch yeah. curse. <laughs> I want Coming it. from somebody who had it this year, I will take it again. I'll take it every other year. <laughs> Hell, if it lasts three years, I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> True. Ross is averaging it every four years. Well, no, Ross, been, Ross well, had the two. Yeah, Ross is 200 inch curse is different because (laughs) he'll shoot one and then three years later he shoots another one most guys gotta wait 10 or 15 years (laughs) ross is averaging one of our buddies i wish you'd love ross and maybe you you maybe have met him but he's got he's averaging a 200 inch deer every five years that's incredible for the last 15 years so every five years and he's early 30s he's a young man yeah he's yeah he's our age Mm -hmm. what's wild illinois illinois yeah yeah i should have said maryland (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, Ross. Maryland. <laughs> well, I think everyone that's listening know that I know, knows that Ross know. is from Illinois. That's our joke. We always say like Delaware, or some random eastern state, and then <laughs> and then we did the show in Harrisburg last year. They're like, "Hey, so you know, Delaware's got pretty big bucks." I'm <laughs> yeah. like, "Yeah, I know." The point <laughs> is, it's far the, away from us. Pictures <laughs> like, "See, this is a Delaware bug." I'm like, "Damn, all right, sorry, you know." But um, yeah, I don't know. That's what we do. That's what yeah. we joke about. <laughs> awesome. I don't know. The big buck conversation, like that, like deeper thought convo on all this is like so interesting to me because everyone's kind of got a different like look on it you know what i mean yeah it's uh it's one of those things like antlers and antler size are so fascinating to everyone that does this i mean mm-hmm. even the guys that say they just hunt for me the, the guys that say they don't do it for the antlers it's still a fascinating part of the white tail deer right like for sure still in the back of their mind yeah, you know yeah. it is i mean it, it, it's it, anyone that tells you differently is lying like it, it's just such a so chasing big antlers is always going to be there and bigger bucks typically have more meat on them so figure that one out <laughs> <laughs> if your year and a half old does not have the same amount of meat as a five and a half old it's up your meat hunter shoot a mature buck yeah, yeah. yeah. right i mean really the from a age standpoint the only thing that makes a bigger rack deer more difficult to hunt is there's more people trying to kill them like right ultimately the same but yeah, it's it's always going to be there, and and I mean I love killing the biggest deer I can find as well, like like mm-hmm. everybody. It's just more or less not making it. it it's, a guy can't compare his situation to what he sees elsewhere. Yeah, that that's what it boils down to. You, you can't consider yourself a bad hunter because you did not you haven't killed a one eighty yet. Yeah, for sure. That's a that's a good healthy way to word that in, in perspective one, one thing that like from watching your videos which if, if someone's not watching your videos on the youtubes they need to get on there and watch it and subscribe we got them playing in the studio right now but 
There's a trend with you having massive deer like under you. And I don't mean like within. I just saw a bobcat too. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> yeah. so, like so, licking the what, steps we're what talking are you, here. What are you putting on your boots? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that product is the next one. I'm oh, coming up. Oh, <laughs> okay, here we go. He's here testing it out. Go. He'll let you know at the end of the season how it works. It's some testers. <laughs> um, but it's just like, man, you have these just big <clears throat> mature studs underneath you or running you over. Or whatever it is, but yeah, the shit that one that ran over that the creek, yeah, it's, Jesus, it's crazy. Like you talk about picking the right tree, it's almost the wrong tree because it was too dang. <laughs> it's, too yeah. it's too close. <laughs> uh, what, for I guess what I'm getting at for you having, I you're clearly calculated in your game plans and your strategies. How are you getting in? Like, what's most important to get into a spot like that where deer are underneath you? Like, what's one main thing you think makes a difference that you've learned in your hunting experience? Well, first of all, I will, I'll be the first to admit there's way more luck involved when it comes to this stuff. Like, yeah. I, you know, I don't list, like saying like you have all the answers or like it happened because of something you did, but I think it's just a growing experience of where to be and when, like when to push the limits, um, on certain spots, like, it, cause you could walk a property and be like, man, this is killer. But mm-hmm. That does not mean you go in there October 1st. That right. it, you kind of wait for intel or you just wait for the right time of the year. And um, like this this hunt that's playing right now, the, the buck that I killed on my farm, that was kind of a unique situation because I hunted that tree three days in a row. And to my knowledge, that's the first time I've ever done that in my life, mm. like, to hunt the same tree three days in a row first of all you got to have somewhat similar wind directions for three days in a row which doesn't happen all that often but what if someone doesn't pay attention to wind i'm I'm getting joking but actually it would be worth you elaborating (laughs) but you can do that while you talk i just yeah rudely interrupted i mean again (laughs) luck like yeah you you could do that and you could yeah you you could you could kill one but but consistency is the key right so yeah for for this this one in particular like I said, consistent wind direction for three days, but entry and exit. It was mm-hmm. so clean, you know, through the creek. I walked walked through a creek about 100 yards, and I had hung this stand a couple of days prior to that in a locust tree that was literally right off the bank. Is one of, one of those stands that you drop some, it's probably in the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's yeah. that close to the creek bank. I'd be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Doug falls asleep. I drop everything. <laughs> but, yeah, it's uh, that, that was ultimately the key. If I could put my – thumb on one thing as to why i had three successful hunts and or three good hunts and and killed on the third day it's that it's the entry and exit was that clean mm-hmm. because you you i'm a big believer in that you burn out spots quicker than you think yeah even if you don't spook anything the day of the hunt i do think there's uh you know damage you do maybe it's four hours later maybe it's yep. the next day they know you know you're, they know you're yep. they know that you're there yeah yeah well yeah. and what what runs out that you don't see you know if you spook one or two does back into the thicket and the two monsters that are in there see that you know it's yeah. what you don't see that actually goes on that's really killing you yeah yeah there there's residual damage for sure yeah. and uh, until you find that again these spots aren't on every property but mm-hmm. if you can find one you know, take advantage of that and, and hunt it at the right time and, you know, hunt it as often as it allows. Like if there's yeah. a spot that's almost bulletproof access, you know, it's hard to burn a spot like that out unless you're hunting, you know, sloppy with the wrong winds or mm-hmm. you're loud or whatever. So that being said, you know, cause I think too, that's what we're all getting better at is like, especially at talking to guys like you and learning more, it's like common pattern entry and exit. And I think what's changed a lot, <laughs> as I learned was like when I'm a kid, when I was a kid hunting, I thought it's dark. Just walk in there. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not how it works. You they know? can't see me. <laughs> yeah, they can't see me. It's dark when I go in. They got night vision. <laughs> so, but I think people think that way a little bit, you know? Um, and I feel like I'm getting better at choosing like, okay, how do I get in up with this wind here in a, in a ditch or a Creek or whatever it may be. But then there's some spots where I'm just like, I know I need to be in there, but I don't know mm-hmm. how to get in or out. Sometimes you, you have to take your chances, obviously. Again, not every property is going to have a spot like that. But even so, there's little things I think you can do to help, you know, reduce the amount of damage you're doing. Um, you know, a couple that, that come to mind, I guess, would be like when you're going in and out, whether it's in the dark or daylight, be patient, go slow. I think oftentimes in our head we get so rushed, like, uh, I just need to get in, I'm, I'm sweating, I'm uh, 
you know, I don't Excited. want a deer to beat me to that spot. Whatever it is, we, mm-hmm. we rush too much, and that's when you start Daylight's to break more my branches. Daylight's biggest thing. And I, yeah, and, in, and you're, you're, just, you're just sloppier, like, and you're not noticing things. If you're trying to rush, you're obviously you're looking down. or you. I, mean, I can't tell you the amount of times you go in an afternoon, and maybe you see a deer, and you just – but if you see it before it sees you, you have an advantage. You can wait it out, or you can mm-hmm. you know, kind of read its body language when you can move. So just being patient with your entry and exit. And then, you know, there's smaller things – on a more specific level, ground scent, trying to minimize that. So rubber boots, the biggest thing, I, I think you could walk right across the spot as long as you don't touch anything above the ground level. Mm. So okay. as long as you're not brushing up against, like, and I think I learned this from from watching deer. Like you, most times they're not nose to the ground. They're, they're sniffing everything around them. They're like knee height. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Knee or waist height. If you're brushing up against stuff, leaving scent on that, I think that's going to get you in a lot more trouble than if you're just on leaves or, or bare dirt or something, and it's just the bottom of your boot contacting that stuff. Well, I mean, right. everyone in this damn room has seen that where a deer is walking around the trail that you walk in on, and every little leaf is... Yeah, it's checking yeah, everything. checking everything. You yeah. know he's smelling you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Do, do you use um, e-bikes for entry exit ever? Have you tapped into that game yet? I've v- used very little of the e-bikes. I like the four-wheel versions. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, the four-wheel electric version. I mean, they're, really? they're pretty new to the market, but that's that's another thing I want to get more involved in. And Yeah, you like stand on it, uh, whatever? You can stand or sit, yeah. but, man, I just, four wheels are just so much better than two, in my opinion. And, yeah. You know, especially, like, you want to stop on a on a bike, you're putting your foot down mm. the ground you know where you just you can stay on the vehicle mm, four wheel you're not even putting anything down just the, just the tires and Dang. it just yeah I, I just like the i like the four wheel four wheel versions a lot better i just yeah i get I, that music the last be. couple of years so i feel like um e-bikes have been like a lot i feel like when i <laughs> talk to people they're like yeah i'd rather just buy a four wheeler i'm like okay yeah i get that like yeah you can do more with a four wheeler and they're probably the same price. Maybe not a brand new four wheeler, but you know. But I'm like, man, the entry exit, it's like a magic carpet almost to a point. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah. they're game changers, no doubt. They they and game changer is a strong word, but they're they're either through that game changer door or they're damn knocking pretty hard on it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It's I would I'd call it a game changer. Like I'm it, with you on that. I'd say game changer. And and that can be area specific too. So like back to the four wheeler thing, if it is deer can get used to a lot. And yeah. if it's an area where they hear four wheelers or farmers or whatever every day, you're gonna get away with it a lot more than yeah. the mm-hmm. guy that's they only hear it when he's coming into hunt. Yeah. I've got I've got a spot that I hunt and it's the farmer's in and out of there frequently on his tractor, truck. I can drive my truck in, put my decoys out, yeah. drive my truck out, hop in the stand and ten minutes later I'll have deer coming out and checking the decoys out. Don't care about it at all. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Hey, all right. So um, I want to continue this big buck conversation because you're clearly calculated some of the deer you've killed and some giants, mature bucks you've killed. When you find a buck, what what's like the one thing you use to like stay on them? Like how do you keep on them and, and be calculated in your sits? Um, I would say property knowledge would be number one, like how – understanding how a deer would use a property Mm -hmm. you know the areas obviously where he beds but more than that the areas he likes to move like where he likes to check so like the deer that i killed this past october just to use a recent example the reason i hung that stand in that little kind of i don't know if you call it a pinch or it's just a small block that opens up into a bigger block i had seen that deer in embarrassed to say past that deer on october 3rd <laughs> Been there. yeah that wasn't very smart here I'll, I'll, I'll say that <laughs> yeah meanwhile on the youtubes here on the screen there's a giant literally at two yards <laughs> see ground scent he got me yeah three days in a row of crawling up that bank um but no i i had seen him in so october 3rd a morning i i just went in i wanted to just kill two does and she was just a very nonchalant hunt, and he was the first deer to walk by r- right after daylight. Mm-hmm. And that time of year, obviously, they're more of more on just uh, if you see them that time of the morning, they're more than likely on their way to bed. Yeah. So I just watched him. Because that was yeah. early season, right? Yeah. What did you say? October? It was the third day of the season, oh. October 3rd. Oof. <laughs> yeah. Oof. 
So <laughs> watching his movement, watching the direction he was going, I started to think, okay, he is, he's got to be on his way back to bed. This isn't, you know, this isn't November 3rd. This is October 3rd. More than likely he's heading toward his, his bed. And so I, I just would look at the map and try to figure out, okay, he's likely bedding over in this area, at least, you know, for now. Mm -hmm. and, and I think deer switch their bedding spots a lot more than we realize. But <clears throat> that's that was ultimately the reason I put a stand in that spot was to be closer to where I thought he was bedding. Mm -hmm. I kind of put myself in between where I thought he was bedding and what I thought was the best doe bedding area, mm -hmm. basically right in that spot. And I killed that deer October 26th. And it was just a, that, that time frame, at least in Iowa, is a really good time frame to be hunting close to those those spots mm -hmm. i mean morning evening doesn't matter they're gonna especially the the biggest most mature buck he's gonna get that first hot doe yeah and that that's really where you want to spend your time so that for that from a recent example standpoint i would say is just property knowledge knowing where the does like to hang out knowing where my best guess of where he was betting mm -hmm. is kind of what killed him no, I like that it's calculated way of thinking. You know, I think too, that's one thing we're all learning as well. I, I'm sure it's like a lot of our listeners, like what, deer are moving with purpose, especially on October 3rd. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like, man, if you think about to tap into what he's doing, not what he's doing in the field, but what he's going to do, like where he's headed, it's like, man, you can really think. And a lot of it almost is like, yeah, of course. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Especially looking back, yeah. Yeah, looking back especially, <clears throat> yeah. It's a, you know, a lot of times these days, again, it gets into that technology um, conversation, but a lot of times trail cameras kill deer, but that was definitely not the case. I hadn't had pictures of this deer in quite a while. Mm -hmm. I think I remember you saying that on the video. Yeah, and I, I wasn't running a ton of cameras. I, my guess is he was in there and I just wasn't getting pictures of him. But I went in solely on that, you know, kind of hunch of like, okay, I want to be by the does. I know he's got to be bedding somewhere close in here. I'm going to take my chances. Conditions are good. I'm going in. Wind's good. Everything's good. Yep. Yeah. The cold front had just came through the day before and that type of stuff. So that, and that, to me, that's more fun. I'd, I'd rather kill a deer that way than, <laughs> you know, a, a trail camera telling me exactly where he was at at a certain time. And yeah. Take yeah. advantage of that. I'm not saying that's the wrong way to do it, but it's, I mean, it's kind of fun. It's not the your puzzle to pieces it. together. Mm -hmm. Well, I've done it for sure, but right. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the puzzle pieces, you know, trying to figure out how they go together is, yeah. is a lot more fun. You learn yeah. a lot more for sure. And one thing I noticed too, like watching your videos, man, especially you got a hammer right underneath you. We all comment on this. We were watching for you showed up. We were, we were uh, fangirling over you a little bit, and uh, I'm like, <laughs> how's this dude so calm? <laughs> like you're just like you're composed, and I'm sure it's experience, but your composure is like. You know, you got a giant underneath you, and we're watching. I'm like, well, I would have forced a shot there, just getting excited, <laughs> thinking the opportunity is going to yeah. fumble out of or your hands. Or said, screw the camera. <laughs> yeah. Or said, screw the camera. But it's like, what? What is it? You just mentally prepare, or what? Do you, what do you got going on? In yeah, there? it uh, it naturally happens as experience. Obviously, the more times you're in that situation, the more comfortable you're going to be. But I would say I'm less calm than what everyone thinks I am. I, I just think I internalize it a little, a little bit more. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like I get just as worked up as, as everybody. And then the kind of the third component is the filming. Like it, it takes a lot of your focus away from the deer and all the yeah. things you have to think about instead of thinking about, okay, where am I going to shoot him? Where am I going to do this? I'm mm. thinking about, okay, how do I keep him in frame and focus and you know, all this. Oh, stuff. that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Not this year, but the other one you shot <clears throat> this year, I was like, if I would have made just made that shot, I would have dropped yeah. my bow right out of the tree. Spike it. <laughs> just spike it to the I, ground. I want to be able to form a sentence. <laughs> One of, yeah. uh, I would do that. Give, give me just, a minute. Everything in the tree would have just been tossed out. I'm, I'm like, just, I'm done. Just NFL <laughs> celebrating. Yeah. I love that. I love that kill because it's just such a long buildup. Like, you get to watch that big buck for so long do his thing. He and bends and, down. Man, my palms are sweating by the time you let that arrow go. It's insane. Oh, we were all yeah. sitting here. When you shot him, like, my heart. <laughs> yeah, don't ever hire us to be your camera guy. We just shit our Shaky. own pants. There. But that's what I love. Get that though. film, huh? <laughs> that's what I love. Doug like, be sleeping. I don't watch that many hunting videos that you get worked up. Like I love that people have had that reaction to that hunt because that I feel like I did my job. I I provide a good replication of the experience I had in the tree. While that's not it's not possible to replicate the whole thing, at least people felt it on some level. 
Yeah. So for sure. I mean, it's, yeah, I think the, the filming definitely shifts my focus away from mm -hmm. all the things. And, and you guys understand like uh, the, the buck fever, whatever you want to call it, it's you getting in your own head. Oh, mm -hmm. for sure. 100%. Yeah, and, and, and me, my focus and my attention being elsewhere prevents that. Do you do a lot of like visualizing of a situation before it happens? <clears throat> like a little. Yeah. But I would say it's still more on the filming side. Really? It's like, okay, if he's over here, how am I going to get the camera on this yeah. way? Or, you know, I got you. <laughs> Interesting. Kudos, yeah. kudos to you, man. Yeah. Yeah. I never camera. thought about the, the camera side, but I mean, clearly, but I figured that'd make it probably makes it more stressful. You don't make it look, you don't seem like it does watching you, but. Um, yeah, I feel like I always try to like mentally visualize the situation. You know what I mean? Like I if, think everyone does. I think when they helpful. sit down, they're like, I'm like, I'm always like, oh, the buck's going to come from over here. He's going to walk. Do right you think everybody me. does it? I do. I do. I do it. But do you think like most people do it? I do. I, I think I, most I think, people do it. I think most hunters out there have that mindset. Does it, so does it ever do. work out that way? No. no. Fuck no. no. Fuck no. Fuck no. Fuck no. You're like predicting and like practice pulling your bow back. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, he's going to be right there. Yeah. But I don't, I wonder if most hunters don't. Do I, d I don't know if most people do or not. I think they should. I think they should. I but do. I don't know if they do or not. Every time I sit down. <clears throat> yeah, I bet I bet most people do. I don't think so. I really? would argue that they, they don't. Mm -hmm. I would say successful mm -hmm. hunters do. Ones that make yeah. good shots probably do. Sometimes yeah. the work, that's big butt comes in. It's just all that went out the window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not sometimes. <laughs> every time. Right at 20 <laughs> yards. Exactly what you did. And then he walks <laughs> in and you're like, I don't know how far he is. <laughs> Fuck. What <laughs> happened? I just blacked out. <laughs> I spent 35 minutes ranging, and I don't at ranging. I don't spots, remember I don't, shit. I don't remember where your bow's on the ground still because you're just imagining. <laughs> See, yeah. and then there's that too. But that's also like what's fun about it. Like your yeah. emotions can overtake you. You know, it's it's so emotional, so mental. Like how many? One example is how many times after you shoot a deer, or at least for me, there's a lot of times I don't remember what pin I used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what no happened? Idea. I don't. What happened? I, I don't know what pin I. I've I been mean, there. I'm like, did I even look through my peep? <laughs> I, yeah. That's what I get mostly. Did I look through my peep? Yeah. You know. This I mean, year, I, even after just making a perfect shot, you're like, I do not remember picking out my 30 yard pin and settling in and squeezing. You know, I don't. You just don't remember any of that. All yep. that shit. All that practice over the summer just goes right out the fucking window. <laughs> or or, or does it make it work for you in the heat of the moment when you realize yeah, you know you're not true. even thinking that's about true. it? It's just all repetition. That's what that, it is. Yeah. That's, that's what it that's is. more. Yeah, that's more what I was saying. Is it's just like something takes over within you and it just it just happens. It's all mm -hmm. instinct. Yeah. That's what it's. Um, I think that comes with the experience too. It's mm -hmm. like yeah, you just do your job in the moment. You know. Like, I just got back from that coos hunt. I just shot, dude. I don't really, like, I sh I know I settled and squeezed and shot and stuff. But, like, Devin's like, damn, you shot fast. I'm like, well, I'm going to let the little fucker get away. <laughs> <laughs> a bastard stood up. I wanted a flight to catch. I already missed my flight. Yeah, we're late. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just like, shit. Oh, yeah, now that I think about it, you know, I did. But that's a good the thing. The heat of the moment, thing, man. It is. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good thing. It's just, it's just funny to look back on, like, you prepare for all this stuff and then you can't remember doing it. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Well, there's being prepared and not knowing what happened because you just did it, and there's being unprepared and not knowing what happened because you're unprepared. <laughs> right. So, yeah. like, it just is split one way, I think, and yeah. you sh your percentage should be you're prepared so much. And that we've all been on both sides of that. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, some clean footage. I think, yeah, that buck's badass. I think for me, one of the, one of the things that I take away from you most is, a you're self filming and how you can stay so mobile while you're self filming. Like most of your hunts in your history of you know what you've done have been hanging hunts. You know, stand on your back, arm on your back, camera on your back. Like how you can plan yourself out to have all that stuff neat, tidy, and know where you're going and stay as mobile as you are and just like change things up on the fly and and get it done while self-filming. Yeah, hanging That's, and hunting is tough enough, let alone when you throw a camera and an arm and everything else in there. Yeah. I would say <clears throat> there's not much emphasis on the neat and tidy part, but <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes everything... In my mind, that's what you got to be. <laughs> something, sometimes it's all a mess. But yeah, it, I look at it more as you got to do what you got to do. And I'm a big believer in being mobile. I'm a big believer in first-time sits being the most effective, even if it's a move of 30 yards. It doesn't have to be much, but it's a different tree. It's a spot that you have the element of surprise on mm -hmm. your side. You know, I, I won't ever change that as long as I 
you know, stay healthy enough to be mobile and, and do hanging hunts and all that. It's just so effective. I mean, it, at least it has for, for me. I'm a big believer in that. And it's, it's funny, even when we talk about, uh, targeting specific deer, you know, even a property, if you've hunted however long, many, many years, and you think, you know, all the good spots, every deer uses the property a little bit different. At least every mature buck does. They mm-hmm. core up mm-hmm. in a different spot. They, they move a little bit differently. That's one of the, the, the coolest things to me about picking out a specific deer and chasing them and trying to figure them out. They're individuals. I mean, yep. that, that's what's mm-hmm. cool. And you have to hunt accordingly. They're like, just like people, man. Yeah. I mean, I have properties that, <clears throat> you know, I have permission on. I've hunted them for mm-hmm. years. I don't have pre-hung sets. It's yeah. Just, I mean, why? Like, it, it may work for one deer th- this year, but next year. I just box you into something that yeah, yeah, might not I mean, be. I won't hunt them because the buck's not going to use that area. So, And as soon as you think you got them, they change something up and yeah, put yeah, your dick exactly. in the dirt. Hey, <laughs> big bucks take effort, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to put in any work. I just want big bucks, you know? <laughs> it's like, I don't want they put in some work. I don't know. It's tough. They always do, but that's what's fun. Like you got to keep it fun. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to have fun with it and learn from it. It's just so. It's always interesting to like. I don't know, I just love the conversation. Good thing, right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we'd have a problem. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm over this. Well, um, you been you bought a farm, and I know you're real into like property. And just from bullshitting before the podcast, you were kind of talking about just thing goals you have and stuff like that. So, like, yeah. what's that process like for you? Like, if you get a farm or finding a farm to buy and then what to do to the farm like yeah it's it's so fun you know first of all i'd never in my life thought i'd be a landowner Mm -hmm. that it's i think it's all a dream for a lot of us but to to work hard and have it become a reality is a a really special thing but then it opens up so many opportunities of having your own dirt to work on it's like there's a million things you want to get done, but everything takes so much time. So that's mm-hmm. kind of where I'm at right now. Like, especially habitat. How do you create habitat? It's a year, I mean, multiple year long process, mm-hmm. but it's enjoyable. It's, it's, it's fun trying different things, trying different food plot locations, trying different stand locations and every property is unique in that regard. Mm. So yeah, I'm, I'm having fun on this property. It's, it's a very huntable property, which I really like. But my goal is it's not a property that right now, you know, it's not going to hold more than one or two mature deer. My goal is to increase that holding capacity, obviously. But if a deer is there, you'll kill him. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm confident in that. Just because of the layout and access for entry, exit, stuff like that. Pretty much both of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So entry, exit, and then just the amount of stand locations with regards to funnels and pinches. You know, if you, again, like, like this hunt. I knew I had to be in that spot. I knew at some point he's going to walk by this tree. Yeah. And it was, it was the third day of, of hunting in a row. So there well, was, he walked by that tree. All right. Yeah. But that, that, yeah, that's one thing. It's probably the most huntable farm I've ever been on from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. Like I've hunted some really, really challenging farms that deer live on 365 days a year and still your chances to kill them are very, very small. Yeah. Um, but this farm, be, I think part of it is because it doesn't have a ton of cover, and so they got to use the cover that's there. But I think more of it is how you're able to use the creek for access and the amount of forced movement spots for the deer that they have to travel by. Mm, okay. So most of the time, these deer are not going to travel across an open pasture, an open field. They're going to stay in the cover, and if they stay in the cover, they're eventually going to walk past one of those pinches. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> Yeah, that's like huntability, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, the huntability is awesome on that farm. And mm-hmm. What's also cool about it is there's a lot of opportunity for different things. It's got enough open area, like I said, pasture, the tillable ground. You know, options to put in CRP, options to put in more food, get some um, money kicked back for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's good income on. I just took some walnuts off of it about two weeks ago. Oh yeah. There's it's, it, it's been pastured. It, I mean, it's had cattle on it for a long time before I, I bought it. So the trees weren't the healthiest trees just kind of pasture walnuts mm-hmm. so yep. there are trees that could fall over in the next windstorm anyways yeah, yeah. it's, it's going to help that timber block phenomenon like you know very well from the standpoint of regeneration mm-hmm. you know, some some better trees it because a lot of those walnuts were you know shading everything out but also just to get some income f- from trees that 
could be useless if they're on the ground. Yeah, for sure. And I think the best thing about owning your own property right now is like, you don't have to ask anyone to do this. I know. You just <laughs> unless it. you're in some government programs, but yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. But which but a lot I, of farmers like, that. like yeah. that's what, that's my whole goal. I that's why I told my old man. I'm like, I just want to own a piece where I don't have to ask if I can put a food plant in. Can I put trim a stand this tree? Over there. Yeah. You, you know yeah, what I mean? It's, it's just like it's fun, man. This time of year when it starts to slow down and the hunting season's over, then your mind starts going in. Uh, how can I build this for the deer and make it better for me next season? And you're just, yeah. I mean, I'm laying awake at night at 10 and 11 o'clock at night thinking about, all right, where should I create this transition between that bed and that food? I mean, it's just a constant it is. thought yeah. process. I'm this thinking time about here. it probably right here in the tree yep. stand. Like I think about it while I'm hunting. Yep. Too. Yep. What can I be doing to make mm-hmm. this better? Yeah. Um, but the other cool part too is like being able to take the money from, this timber sale I'm, I'm my goal is to put it back in the property put a pond in and do some of the oh, cool. stuff to to make the property better for what i want it to yeah and it for. probably will add value to yeah, the farm if you ever do value, sell it yeah. or roll it into something else yeah so when you guys buy it, it you remember, oh. remember that <laughs> yeah you see that all done now <laughs> so uh, having a property that's so <laughs> yeah, making play-doh snakes <laughs> over here <laughs> hurry up and get that done yeah, yeah hurry up i'm ready to buy it now <laughs> is uh having a farm that's set up so huntable like you said, you feel confident there's a mature a tr- mature deer on it, you're going to kill them. Does it kind of pain you thinking that you might, you know, you, you obviously you're investing and you're putting time into it to sell it, to roll into something else. Is Like, are you kind of like, shit, I want to keep this one and then find another one that's also super huntable? It's, it's a battle I have with myself all the time. My goal, like a lot of people, is to have more acres to manage, more acres to hunt. And I enjoy the process too. So mm-hmm. like if I get a farm, let's say I get this farm to where it's more or less maxed out from the from the standpoint of what work can I do to improve it, mm-hmm. I want to move on to the next one. So you want that next challenge. Over again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Part problem the is I fall in love quick with farms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that you can't do if you want to like keep you know, turn and burn, you can't fall in love with Can't the get farms. sentimental that, with them. That's my weakness. Got like, that heart on your sleeve. Austin, yeah, you get sentimental with any of the farms you, you've had? You shoot a big deer on a farm. It's like once you sell that farm, you're kind of letting go. You feel like you're letting go of that spot and that memory, you know, a place you could walk around with your boy on. So oh, man, it's, it's tough. It's tough to let a farm go. But I've, uh, when I go into it now, when I buy a farm, I've, I've kind of got the mindset, okay, my goal in the long run in 10 years is to be here. And the only way I can get there is to sell this farm and to move into a new one and to, you know, just kind of keep rolling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, you got to keep that perspective, but it's not easy. It's, but it's a battle. <laughs> it's got to be. Well, I don't know from experience, but it's, <laughs> it's got to be a battle. I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. Uh, couldn't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, It'd be a lot cooler if you did. You know? yeah. But you'll find, you'll find a farm that you just, I'll, I know I'll find a farm someday. It's like, okay, this is my forever farm. This is where I'm going to build my house. I'm going to live here. I'm not, this is mine. I'm not going to let this one go. Yeah. I've yeah. already got one of those, but yeah. 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 I That's try to searching. envision it. I don't have a big piece, you know. My wife and I have a small piece that we just bought last, uh, well, last June. And so I like uh, I killed a buck there, which like I never thought would happen to me in my life. One own ground, one kill a buck on it. Like have ground I could get that had a buck on it. Yeah. And then so, but but it's like I don't feel. I mean, I do feel sentimental to it, but I'm trying to envision like what I would do or if I sell it, how I would feel. It'd be hard. It's hard not to. It's hard to ignore all that. Yeah, it is. you know what I mean. Especially being so close to home, because you're drive by and be like, "I used to own that." Yeah, yeah, like, right. Uh, right. I wish I had that. Stuff. That's why I want. I want something close, but not like a mile down the road close. Dude, yeah. I'm. Sam's a great wife, man. But I'm working on an old sugar mama that's about to kick the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Sam will understand. Hey, too, She'll understand. Hey. She'll understand. I'd be like, hey, now you can get moved back in. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Give me two years. <laughs> really, I know, like, I want the hunting to be difficult and challenging and fulfilling, but gaining property, I want it to be kind of immoral and disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. Hey, you're going to go places. <laughs> anyway, Jared. <laughs> Cut through. Cut through. You're hey, going can you make that sound better? Uh, <laughs> yep. no, that one's not fixed. <laughs> yeah, say what I said. Uh, yeah, smarter. Fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, say what I just said, Jerry, but say it smarter. Let's do this. No, no fixing that one. <laughs> it's like, it right. is what it is. He's on like, that one. You're on your own. He's yeah. checking his watch. He's like, like, I think I gotta get home. Going? <laughs> how long is this going? All right, now we got. We just <clears throat> talked all the stuff that I was interested in talking to you about, and there is more. But the real question we wanted to get to that we got brought up at dinner, and this we're, we're going to be fist, all of us will fight each other after this. 
the rompola buck is it real or fake round table <laughs> and then proceed to argue austin you're the king of this buck question there's i mean there's no question it's real okay what, bold okay so what what do you think happened this this guy that has killed 10 giants in a place where giants aren't normally killed you think this guy went in and just fabricated this deer to blow up his ego when he doesn't like people in the first place? Strong points. What do you think, Mr. Jared? I don't know that I have an opinion on it, to be honest. I know I, I know you hate that. I know that that's <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I know, wrong. I know. Hey, next you have, class, you have to pick. I, I know I'm about to get booted for that. <laughs> but I am very interested in here, watching the fight. I'll, I can judge the winner of this. Okay. My money's not on Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Kurt and I can't be the only ones going back and forth. Come here. on. I think it's fake. Okay, explain. Because <clears throat> I don't know why he didn't enter it. If everyone's already there, they already got pictures of like The this. dude was a measure in a measures club, too. Yeah. So why not enter the buck? Do you measure any? I don't know much about it. Like, I haven't deep dive into it like you guys have. I haven't really has, he measure, has he entered any other bucks? I don't he's, know. Yeah, he's got. I don't know if it's through Boone and Crockett or who it's through, but there's like a Michigan club that he. Yeah. You can look and see his name highlighted like seven or eight times. For like, by the way, so a Michigan book buck there? is 105. <laughs> but he's got some fucking giants in there though, and he has one buck that is genetically very similar to this buck in question. Okay. So why didn't he enter it? Well, I think because there was so much controversy, it hadn't hit that drying period yet. So by the time it got there. I think he actually had to sign a contract between him and the Hanson Buck saying that him claiming to be the new world record was actually hurting the sales of this Hanson Buck. The value buck. of it, yeah. yeah. so he had to basically sign this non-disclosure saying, I won't promote my buck anymore. I did. I Good. did read an article on that. Lee, what do you think? So I'm kind of on the fence, but I do lean towards the fact that it is real. There are some of the things, like the way the deer's face looks in the pictures, it's just like, that doesn't look like yeah, a deer to me. Yeah, but every deer looks the so different, People don't man. like the droopy ears. Yeah, yeah but deer, deer have droopy, droopy ears some, in I've some seen, photos. It's, it's yeah, not the I've droopy ears to me. Ears. It's like from his eyes down through his nose. Just looks odd to me. I, I do think the deer is real because um, I know, you know, I bring up your point of why isn't it in the book. I know of deer that have been killed. That would be the typical world record, but nobody knows they've been killed. Yeah, people I, just don't want the publicity. Don't want which it, that yeah. one had the publicity. What have right. you been but, up to, Lee? Huh? What have you been up <laughs> hey, to? Is this yo. a cult thing? <laughs> Wait, <laughs> cult, 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 cult. No, he, there's, no, I mean, there's a lot of people out there. He won't let these people enter. It. That's what's going <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. They have to surrender their bodies. There's yeah. giants out there that get killed every year that you They're never wrecks. hear about. That's yeah. true. That's very true. And this one just so happened that it caught news and people heard about Eric it. Eric for sure doesn't give a fuck about this at all. But no, I it's, 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 it, no, I like I give a fuck about it. I just haven't like <laughs> I was, I was, I was like, like, with a fuck. thirty inch beard. <laughs> <laughs> like I just haven't like dove into it like you guys have. Like yeah. it's not one thing I'm like, ooh, I gotta know about this buck. Is it real? Is it fake? Like, just a cool tidbit. So to your point, yeah, I kind of don't give a fuck. But for the sake of what <laughs> we do, fake, for the sake, uh, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> Go, okay, it's hey, real. Kurt, wow. You're losing. Wow. Just an interesting side note. I've always felt like a connection with this deer because it was killed on November 13th of 1998. So that was the same day I killed my very first buck with a bow. 98 is 1998. When... Yeah. So. He I don't necessarily. Jesus, that doesn't mean. Shit. I might have to side with him just. For <laughs> Shut that. up. Yeah. I mean, Shut up, Doug. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean <laughs> shit. <laughs> I really, I honestly haven't looked that deep into this thing. See, like, that's where I'm at. I, but I have a little. I heard like uh, Steve Rinella was on Rogan. They talked about it a little bit, and from like hearing that, I was like, the dude was a measure in the Wisconsin club thing, whatever. Then shoots this deer, then gets all weird. To me, it was almost like. He did it. Maybe he did it as I don't know why, and then it was like, oh fuck, I don't want to get caught up. But if it was real, what, make your replica like the Hanson Buck did, post and ghost, and then just dip out, get your money. You don't got to do the world tour. Oh, he didn't like the publicity. It's just your photo. You killed the buck. Let some guys make some replicas. You go sit at home in your rocker and don't talk to anybody. Do one interview or don't at all, yeah. and sell the the rack to collectors. What's the big deal? Drink your so, PBR and get money. Here's the difference, you know, <laughs> the Brewster buck that was shot in Illinois a few years ago. That I don't know if it still is, but it was like the archery record, yeah, non typical record. Yep. yep. 
That dude wouldn't do our podcast. I think I'm, I think he's done a podcast, but the guy didn't even want to be talked to when we talked to him. He's just like didn't like attention, and okay. And then look, Dustin Huff kills that big giant typical. He's doing like press media tours, and yeah, you know it's he's helped his music career. He's on tour with it. You can do what the Brewster guy know. did. Maybe the difference was like that that uh, non disclosure statement that he had to sign uh, with the Hanson Buck. I don't know. To me, I would. So be where like, is this Buck? He still has well, it, right? Uh, there's rumors that it's burned up in a fire. Yeah, I mean, no, fuck, nobody, of course, right? Nobody the Asians <laughs> took it to the black market and ground it down for aphrodisiac. <laughs> my, my, my honest opinion is it's tucked down in an old dingy basement somewhere with his other 37 no. trophies. Isn't he, is he still alive? I think he is. Someone needs to go talk to that old geezer and just be like, hey, listen, <laughs> let's, let's, let's x-ray this bitch it out. 1998 until now, we're still sitting here drinking beer hey, and talking about it. I, I love, fucking love it. I love that, too. I yeah. do love that. And part, part of me is just like... So you're telling me no one's seen that buck since the day he killed it? Well, there's been guys that apparently have examined it. No, but. There, there were three guys the day, or not the day it was killed, but like in the following few days that saw it, and they were all reputable, reputable people. In the community, and the one was a game warden, and the one was a scorer, and they both said, without a doubt, that deer is 100% real. Yeah, oh, so shit. when you hear, awesome. test- <clears throat> when you hear testimony from other people like that, it's like, okay, that adds some credibility to this guy. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, maybe It'd be cool if it was real. Mitch, right. if you're listening, come on the podcast. Yeah, let's let's do a podcast. Yeah, don't he be calls such us tomorrow. <laughs> what? I'm like, hey, man, sorry about all the bad things I said. <laughs> I just was trying to get you to come out of hiding. <laughs> and he brings it here. <laughs> and he brings it and smacks me. Yeah. <laughs> Stabs you with it. No, you don't have to stab me. You could smack me. I'd take that honorably. Is this real? <laughs> <laughs> Is this real? Yeah, tines me, G2s me in the eye. So, I, got, I don't know. I got a question off of that conversation. You shoot a world record typical. What amount of money does it take for you to sell that original rack? Okay. Seven original dollars. rack, but we get... Here's what. Here's what I would do. Cause I've thought about it. Cause I'm gonna kill one. So, <laughs> okay. I want so to remember how you had to like visualize what's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to dream big. I'm in the middle of doing that, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I know big antlers don't matter, but to me, this is my all-time goal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I'm done. So, um, god damn, this footage. We got we still got Jared's videos going on. This would never happen to me. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's happened to Jared. What like eight times in your career? Look at, look Something at how he's that, like. That I don't even know how you're hanging on to your bow many. at this point. I know what, what are you the, thinking the, right the arrow here? is fuck, quivering fuck, a little fuck, bit there, though. Yeah, there, there's some shaking going on. <laughs> so if you... Um, out right here, I'm thinking, you screwed. how is this buck going to get away? Yeah. This is the 194-inch <laughs> typical video that we're watching, if you guys... Because you have no it. shot right there, right? Do you have a shot there? No. What is he, like five yards right there? Yeah, but it where he's at, I, I have no shot back. You know they're close when the camera's it's like straight up straight and down. down. So when he turns like this, you're like, oh, shit, I might have a chance. <clears throat> what was crazy is when he when he takes a few more steps and is facing right at me, like I'm fully prepared. You're right here Holy in a second. Shit. But I'm fully prepared for him to turn you to left. You know, he's facing me, so he's either gonna be broadside going this way or broadside going this way. Dude, that you deer is so bad. Right there where he's facing you right here. Oh, but yep. you did such a great job to keep him in frame that whole time when he's that close. Like, I would have just backed out and got on the bow, you know. I'd have had him in frame, but it would have been so zoomed oh. out. So so right here, I'm like, okay, he's either going to turn left and be broadside or turn right. Like, he can't go. He If he goes forward, he's going to run in my tree. Look at his nose. Though. You're like, is he going to bust me or not? And I'm thinking he can't go backwards, and he does some dang swim move through this branch. <laughs> Some like you gotta move. be kidding me! It looks quiet <laughs> at in that there point. Too. Like there's no, not a lot of wind. It's very quiet. Yeah. yeah, that's that was what made the vocalizations cool too. With the mm-hmm. the does grunting. Yeah. The, the, I'm the doe grunting is what brought him in. You had so many deer in there. I'm assuming the thermals were just kind of lifting a little bit that morning. They, they, yeah, thermals helped me out tremendously. The the does that came and walked basically basically brushed up against my tree and went downwind to me. You know, they that was why he was bedded. And so that the fact that they didn't bust because he just sat there and watched. I don't even think the does knew he was there. Yep. He just watched them, just one, two. Oh yeah, he did a weird, a yeah, weird swim move thing. It yeah, snaps a branch. <laughs> oh my gosh, <clears throat> how far is he right here? Like probably eight or nine yards. Oh. He he gives me one, one little look here, <laughs> dude. Gives him the old cur whammy. How big a pocket? This is how good your videos are. We just shut up oh, from an argument. Oh, looks right at you. I love that. Did he hear you draw, you think? Something. Oh, damn. 
Beautiful. You're a stallion. You got to have a hammer on you, dude. <laughs> Kid's got a piece on him. <laughs> Welcome to the working class bow hunter. <laughs> You're a stallion. Damn. Dude. That's cocky. <clears throat> All right, back to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what would you do? I, I would sell the original. Giant, if I, it was a giant typical, I'd sell the original, but I would want the rights to the replica, and I would have full disclosure on selling replicas for other guys' collections. Because that deer's going to see more people and do more in somebody else's hands. I'd buy it for that re right reason, hopefully. And then if I can get a perfect replica and I get rights so, and to make as many as I want. Yeah, that's, a, that's probably a good approach. I'd sell it in a heartbeat, too. Like, yeah, like, I mean, because really, like... Everything's for sale. It just depends on the amount of money. How, there I, is no fucking amount of money that would make me sell that the real antler if I kill the world record. Typically. So... No amount of money. We had... I'm not going to say... You must have too much money. You could go no, buy, I don't. <laughs> trust me, I do not. But, you could go buy five <laughs> mouths of Iowa. <laughs> come on. Do it. No amount of money. If, Dude, there, I'd never kill a bigger record in my life. Bye -bye. <laughs> world record typical? Bye-bye. No, no fucking amount of money. We're talking... How, how much is the Milo Hansen buck worth? Millions? Couple mil? No amount of money. I have you no could idea. offer me ten it's million dollars and I wouldn't much, sell it. What? Yeah, I think it is. Really? Yeah. I Dude, you look at what they can do with replicas guy. today. Ten million dollars. I, I would own the real antler and oh. own the replica rights. Maybe you get visitation rights. Nope. There is no. You get people, every people are going to eat me alive for this. There is no damn amount of money that oh. I would make me sell them. I, right. Right. I can't say that. I'm a, I'm a shed guy too, and I mean small sheds I'll sell, but there is no amount of money that I would sell a, a world class shed for. No amount of money. No freaking amount of money. Come on, there was bro, a scandal at the deer. <laughs> you are an oak. There was a there was a scandal at the deer class a couple of years ago where um, some farm sheds got bought as wild for twenty grand, mm -hmm. and I, and Jackie was standing next to me and she goes, "You better sell them if somebody offers you twenty grand for antlers like that." And I said, "No freaking way, bye -bye. no way okay. in hell." Here's a I, article from Wide Open Spaces. Um, where what was that? Shot at ninety three. The Dixie Chick song. <laughs> what was 93? Uh, the handsome buck. The handsome buck was, yeah. Um, 213. I just saw it where it said the value. Saskatchewan. Saskatoon? Saskatoon. Which are raffles. Yes. Let me see. Uh, how big mm, is it? How much Rifle. is it worth? Yes. They shot, didn't he nick part of the antler? Oh, damn it. Well, <clears throat> I don't remember. Right, in an interview, he estimated he made 60 grand a year off his record buck for almost a decade. So he made at least 600,000. That's what he's showing on paper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. You can triple that. <laughs> Let's see. Um, like I said, people are going to eat me alive for it, but there is no damn amount of money. To me, 60 it's 60 grand a year. The fact that I could have a replica that you likely would not be able to tell the difference, yeah. like visually. Yeah. I know the best I'm antler pair in the world. And I, I'm good. I'm, there's I'm no not way. with you. Replicas yeah. today are a lot different than they were 20, 30 and years 93. ago. And 93. No way. Yep. It, yeah, but here's yeah. the thing: if it benefits your life and your family, okay. yeah, you're you still have the same enjoyment. <laughs> you're gonna be six sorry, years babe. old with a sorry, glass babe. of bourbon, <laughs> staring at, it, arguing with your wife, you're, about dude. It. I'm That's never fine. asking you for investment advice. Dude, the thing <laughs> is, is you, you can sell as many replicas to Cabela's and Bass Pro and Shields and all those, and own the rights to the replicas. So you're making money off the replicas as well. Here's my There's thing, though: just, you always gotta worry about means so too much to me. I get you, but it ain't worth as much as a real deal. We have yeah, Bass well, Pros, like, we'll we give you a mill for the world nope. record typical. Wouldn't do it. <laughs> Fuck. Y'all yeah. can call me crazy, but wouldn't do it. We do know. Where do I sign? We know a guy that had the art state archery record in Iowa for a couple of years. Yep. And I'm not going to say what he he told us, what they offered him. And it was way better money than I thought it would be. And he turned it down, I think, at first, but then accepted so the, it. The guy that I know that I grew up around rebuilt that rack from, oh, pic really? from pictures in a score sheet. Really? Mm hmm No shit. Yeah. It's the one that I told you to get on the podcast. We should do a podcast with. Okay. Well, let's do it then. Sure. We'll line it up. But yeah. <laughs> you you would sell one if you shot the record typical? Yeah. Yeah. Who, I, who it, wouldn't it, if I could have a replica that looks the exact same, <clears throat> I mean, to me, it's just... You could have a replica not tell anyone. Like, we could walk in and be like, oh, we yeah. had no idea. Yeah. Maybe, no maybe this dude with the... The big buck, the uh, the Rompola buck, maybe he's building up the value. And he's going to come out and just give it all to his grandkids or something. Nah, he's, oh, oh, man, it's, it's an investment plan. Oh, that's pretty late. When he rolls that baby out of the basement, what do you think that thing's going to be worth? <laughs> I mean, somebody with deep pockets will probably buy it, yeah. right? Yeah. Collector. Some big collector roll in there. He's probably waiting for Milo Hansen to Until die. <laughs> That's why the disclosure expires. <laughs> Guess who's back, yeah. baby? They, gotta, they want to buy it. That's, That's, what, That's what the contract says. He can't say anything until he dies. Yeah. <laughs> and also, he goes. <laughs>
So, yeah. so talking big bucks, I want to know. Why would you sign that contract? <laughs> well, At least changing the subject. <laughs> but I don't know. No, it'd, be, it'd be fucking great though, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, I want to know, and, and the, you know, a lot of people gawk it or balk it, telling numbers and stuff. I want to know your whitetail score sheet, like w- what you have at what caliber, like how many one, like start at the top and go backwards. I don't even know if I'll get it all right. Uh, the well, this year the 194 is the biggest. Um, what it's funny because I didn't think he was that big, but well, you passed him. I so. did pass him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to leave that. And out I of get it. grief. I try <laughs> to leave that out of it. That's pretty cocky. I try to leave that out. Of <laughs> I told you, the dude's the got stars. a hammer on him. <laughs> uh, G two isn't the biggest. <laughs> I yeah, I've got a few in the 80s. <clears throat> a few, okay. Start with, 80, start with the biggest one. 86, two 83s, and an 80. Hammers. Don't you have another 190-inch, like, 10 with split brows? Mm-mm. Was he in the 80s? Probably the 86, I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah, that's what it was. Yep, that's all. Yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, I think I have more in the 80s and 70s, actually. I think I have <laughs> two or three 70s. And that's a build like up one in the 60s and the rest are just your average <laughs> my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's awesome man but it, it 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 really does go back to the original conversation we had like it <clears throat> to me i do get a lot of requests to like do a video of the trophy room and yeah i mean i get it i get from the outside perspective like it's interesting to see it's cool to to talk about and you know we all love big deer but I mean, if you wanted to really make your trophy room look impressive, you'd hunt differently. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I mean, it would be less about the chase and more about the kill and, you know, gun hunt and all that type of stuff. But mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. It, it's hard to talk about because I, I do love big deer as much as the next guy. Mm-hmm. But it, it's also like, I know I'm never going to have the most impressive trophy room or score lineup or whatever as other people just because. I, I, I hunt differently. Yeah, you know, I, I know that's, that's pretty damn impressive. If you ask me. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. Yeah. I mean, well, it's calculated. And you're you big fan. Strictly archery hunt, right? You don't touch a gun. No, I I just don't have interest. I mean, I, again, it you have to tell the line. I'm not trying to offend people to do. I have no problem with people to gun hunt. Right. It's a personal but, thing. But the thing that I push is like hunt the way you want to hunt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you do not have to gun hunt to be successful. Like do not define success by yep. the amount of inches. For sure, have on your wall, um, but yeah, I just I love the chase. I love, I, I love everything about bow hunting. And you know, someday, you know, I can make it. Like I said earlier, I can make it more difficult on myself. I I hope to spend a lot more time recurve hunting and really? and up that challenge. And I mean, uh, I know that's that's you know kind of your specialty, but that's my goal is to be more proficient in that and get more time to practice and <clears throat> potentially be exclusive reeker of something. Well, I, we were out there watching your videos earlier and I said, man, this guy's like dialed in to be like the perfect recurve video killer. Nobody's filming traditional kills and you're obviously dialed in enough to get these deer right under you. So you're like a perfect candidate to be like, mm-hmm. you know, shoot these huge deer with a recurve at 10 minus yards on video. Like nobody's doing that be badass yeah, there's be, oh, so i can cool. think of just a couple guys like um i'm drawing a blank on the one guy who does it who, he's a redheaded guy logan glassburn is a yep. monster him andy kelly from ohio andy is a yep. F- yep. Killer he's a, that guy's a monster so yeah but yeah man you're you're in that wheelhouse it'd be fun I, again it goes back to the reason you do it right for sure it's yeah. the challenge and yep, keep yep. making it harder on yourself and that's take that that's next level take that next fun. level yeah yeah I love it. It takes a lot of time to practice though. I mean, you know that and that's that's been my limiting factor up to this point is the time. Like I, I don't wanna go to the woods with it until I feel very, very comfortable. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. I'm just getting off there flinging There's arrows. <laughs> Wee Yeah. yeah we'll get them next time. Next yeah. time. <laughs> Almost had you. Hey, it's my first time. Almost had you. <laughs> we'll yeah. get them next time. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. You wanna feel you want to feel like you're there and you're going to like pull it off. <laughs> yeah. I guess. I, I killed a turkey with it a few years ago and that was fun. But That's impressive. With a recurve? Was, yeah. 
Oh, shit. You can't even kill a turkey with but, a gun. Uh, Neither can I. It, 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 took, it, it, it did take two shots. I hit the decoy on the first shot, and then a mass center punch the decoy. <laughs> Picked the wrong one. <laughs> I killed the shit out of the Hey, decoy. I haven't done that. I haven't shot the turkey with the decoy. Yeah. Dude, yeah. That's tough, man. If you can kill a turkey with a recurve or a longbow, that's, that's you a, can kill a buck for sure. A decoy with one, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had to crawl out and get my arrow back and then crawl back. <laughs> I had to reshoot. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, well, that, that was that was a fun hunt. It was in the snow. Like you don't get the turkey out in the snow very no, often, but that's we, cool. we, we got a, a late snow and in that, Iowa. That was a fun hunt, yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, dude, it's been awesome getting to talk to you. I hope you don't feel like you uh were like, Why the hell am I here? Oh man, this is this is a lot of fun. I hope you come back and we can tap into more stuff. We'll we'll find something you feel strongly about and we'll get you arguing with us. If there is yeah. anything, I'll find out. There there is for sure. I just don't know I care much I care enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> whether a buck's real or not. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's a good point. It's just, but uh, it was uh, it's entertaining. I mean I, I I don't I I'd say I'm probably more similar to you in that I haven't dug into it, but it's it's entertaining to watch mm-hmm. different people's perspectives and yeah. all that. Well, we couldn't come in here and piss you off the first episode, so we have to like kind of warm you up, and you're like, ah, oh, they're not bad. They're kind of dumb, but they're not that bad. <laughs> and then when you come back, and then we'll really just disappoint you. Then that'll be you. the last time. Explain yeah. things like idiots. We'll yeah. really yeah. show our asses on the second one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you see our whole asses, and yeah. uh, then you'll be like, yeah, maybe I won't go back. Yeah. <laughs> no, anytime, man. I'd, I'd love to come back, and uh, this is a lot of fun. You guys do it right. Thanks, man. Where can people find you? I'm posting to YouTube right now. For now, I'm not a big social media guy, so, I mean, you can follow me there. Just don't expect much. Okay. (laughs) But uh, YouTube is primarily where I'm putting the content now. Um, Might get into some more platforms, but it seems like that's YouTube's where people want to be right now, so that's Mm -hmm. where I'm posting the video. Very cool, man. Well, the videos are awesome. If you guys are out there, um, probably know who Jared is already, but if you don't, um, do yourself a favor, subscribe to his YouTubes. It's a... Stellar. I mean, we're kind of like awesome. watching, captivated by the videos while we're having conversation with the guy <laughs> right in front of us. So uh, that says a lot. So thank you so much, man. Thank you, guys. Uh, I appreciate you it. You guys want to add anything before we close the fuck out of here and get moving? And I don't know why I cussed just No, it was a great podcast. I'm just glad Doug didn't fall asleep on this one. <laughs> yeah, good job, Doug. Normally when we talk big deer, Doug gets a little bored. Yeah. Yeah, He's, he's been there. Falls asleep. Man, I feel that. special, Doug. Yeah, it was only 190, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've had better. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Thanks for coming, though. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Cool. You guys good? I'm good. You know what to do. Go shoot your bow. We love you guys. Peace.